Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you very much for coming. Good morning. Absolutely. Pleasure to be here. Uh, let me give a brief introduction, and then we'll go into some questions. Um, Secretary Mnuchin is the 77th Secretary of Treasury. He's a native of New York, graduated from Yale in 1985, where he was the publisher of the Yale Daily News and also a member of Skull and Bones, which he cannot acknowledge because it's a secret society. <laughs> he joined in 1985. Is that right? You cannot acknowledge it's it. It's true that I, if I were, I couldn't acknowledge it. Right. Okay. So uh, he joined Goldman Sachs in 1985. Uh, became a partner in 1994 and rose up to be a member of the management committee. He was the uh, chief investment, uh, chief uh, information officer of Goldman Sachs, also headed the mortgage securities department at one point. He left in 2002 after 17 years and formed Dune Capital, which did a number of financial investments, one of which was Indy Bank, which he bought from the FDIC. He also was involved in uh, the uh, entertainment business. He, through Dune uh, Entertainment, he financed a number of movies, including and co-produced them, uh, Avatar, uh, Mad Max, Superman, Batman, other movies like that. Ultimately sold IndyBank to CIT. After that occurred, he told me uh, when I saw him at a dinner once that he was going to become the campaign finance chairman for Donald Trump. I said, you'll never be heard from again because um, <laughs> that probably won't lead to anything. Um, that's correct. I, that is correct. Right. Um, but uh, my predictions are usually wrong, and so um, it worked out reasonably well for you, and um, uh, you became the... Uh, and, and for the president. And for the president. <laughs> and uh, became Secretary of the Treasury, appointed by the president, and was confirmed by, on February 13th of 2017. So, um, have you talked to your accountant about your own taxes? Are they going up or are they going down? Well... I'm definitely making a lot less money in this job, so I can categorically say, but my rate is, is going up. Going up. So uh, given California and New York, uh, my rate is going up. So are your friends um, still friends of yours because their tax rates are going up, or are your friends saying they're happy? Are what, your friends are happy with the tax bill or not? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, th I think people understand the economic impact that this is having, and this will continue to have. And I think, you know, even for people in New York and California, there's a slight increase. It's not, it's not a very big increase on okay. the high end. But uh, obviously we saw yesterday Walmart's announcement, which was very impressive. Uh, over a million people at Walmart getting additional bonuses. We're now up to over 130 companies and 2 million workers that have gotten raises and special bonuses. Okay, so uh, the process of getting a tax bill through Congress, were you really convinced you could get it done in the first year? I, I really was. I mean, or, originally I was on the record saying we could get it done by August. There was a schedule to get it done by August. Obviously, the health care delayed things. But, uh, yeah, we, this was a well-thought-out plan. Okay. Now, it didn't go through what's called regular order, regular okay. order meeting committee hearings and so forth. Um, and do you think that the regular order is more or less uh, a good thing to avoid in tax legislation, or are you happy with the way it went? Actually, technically, it did go through regular order. I think the issue is it went through reconciliation, which was 51 votes, but uh, technically it did go through the committee process in regular order. So is there anything in the bill that you wish was not in there, or is there anything that uh, you're not happy with in the bill? No, I, I think... Um, you know, overall, I couldn't be more pleased with it. Um, you know, if, if, if you look at the process, and I think what worked very well is, first of all, the House uh, committees had worked on taxes and thinking about this for a long time. So, you know, way before the president and I showed up, they had been working, had gone through a blueprint. During the campaign in developing the president's economic program, um, we spent a lot of time with him thinking about taxes, and taxes were a major part of his platform and what he was going to do. And uh, I, I think we couldn't be more pleased. That's not to say that every single page and every single light item, but uh, I think we couldn't be more pleased uh, with the overall bill. Now, sometimes after you pass these major bills, there is a so-called technical corrections bill. But to get a technical corrections bill passed, you need 60 votes, presumably. So are you going to try to get a technical corrections bill, or you don't need one? Um, I think that's something we'll, we'll see. So, uh, you know, I don't know if we will or we won't. It's something that we've, we've talked about. Um, I would say 
you know, uh, as opposed to everyone else who has now moved on to other legislative things, our number one issue right now is implementing the tax plan. It's, uh, it's a massive amount of work at Treasury and the IRS. Yesterday we just announced the new withholding tables, so people will get tax breaks in, in February. I'd say the good news is there's, there's nothing that we've identified so far that we think is particularly problematic, that we think we'd need a technical correction. There are like 80 sections of the bill that are left to the Secretary to put right. out regulations. So we, we have a lot of work at Treasury and the IRS. Now, very often when you pass new tax legislation, the IRS has more work, but there doesn't seem to be new evidence of, uh, of hiring more IRS agents. Is there an effort to go get more a IRS agents, or you don't need to do that? No, I'd say, I mean, this touches every single aspect of the IRS, from technology to processes to forms. And uh, we are speaking with Congress about getting additional funding for the implementation. So, so we, we would expect that we would we would hire a significant number of people to help with the implementation. But not to audit people. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, I would say in, in all seriousness, one of my projects for the IRS is to look at how we can use technology much more okay. for audits. So, you know, I, I, th I think we want to make sure that we automate. I think, as you know, there's something that's called the tax gap, which is the theoretical difference between what we do collect and what we should collect, and we're going we're to look at using technology yeah. to narrow that. And one of the uh, most important changes in the tax uh, code as a result of the bill is the elimination of the deduction for state and local taxes, where, where there's a limitation of $10,000. Yes. Um, that was controversial and politically uh, controversial, I suspect. Do you think you could have avoided doing that if you had phased in the corporate tax cut? In other words, the corporate tax cut comes in right away. Suppose you had phased it in over five years, would you have been able to keep that deduction? Well, David, as you, as you know, kind of within reconciliation, we had a certain amount of money that we had to work with. So there were trade-offs, and that's one of the trade-offs we could have made. I would say the elimination of what people refer to as SALT, state and local taxes, that was something that was part of the House blueprint from day one. Um, that was something we kind of thought through. I think, you know, the $10,000, I mean, I realized for people in this room, that may not seem like a lot for state and local taxes, but that was a meaningful impact for a big chunk of the country. And uh, I, I think we had the right balance. I mean, I think the issue, and we've said this from day one, is, you know, why should the high tax states be subsidized? And let me just say, because then normally the follow-on question is, well, the high tax states are donor states and they give more money. And my response to that is that's because there's more wealthy people that live in those states. Well, some people say it was an effort to, by the red states to tax the blue I, I states. Don't, I don't think that's the case at all. There was, there, was, there was not one meeting that I was ever in that this became. Okay. Anybody said this is a political issue. It was an economic issue. What do you think about governors who might be saying to their constituents, you can make your payment to your state and local taxes and make it a charitable deduction? Um, I, think I, think, I, I, I think that's one of the funniest things I've possibly heard. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I will say we'll wait to see the language, but uh, I, be... I, I, th I think most people understand the concept of a charitable deduction okay. that is voluntary, that goes to help people and things like that is very different than the high cost of real estate taxes okay. in my favorite two locations, New York and California. So there would be no auditing of governors who propose that? In other words, you wouldn't audit their taxes. Uh, we wouldn't audit their taxes, but I can assure you we will, uh, we will audit real estate taxes okay. Now, this year. the people who worked on this tax bill, the gang of six? Was yes. It? Gang of six. So what were those meetings like, and how did you avoid the press knowing when you were meeting, and, and what was the interchange like? Well, again, I, I think one of the things that worked really, really well is this was a team effort. So, you know, I, I think there were a lot of people in the beginning who said, you know, well, you know, the White House and Treasury, you should put out your own, you should put out your own plan, you should write the bill. And I think it was very clear to us from the beginning that we needed to make sure the Treasury, the White House, the House and the Senate were on the same page. And when we started the process, I think the House and the Senate were pretty far apart. And we, we worked every week on narrowing those differences. And uh, today... And, the and then just to answer your second question of how did we 
avoid, uh, you know, one of the good things about uh, having the Secret Service follow me around is that they can take you through kitchens and garages okay. and okay. things like that conveniently. So uh, the tax bill, it is said by some uh, that it will increase the U.S. debt by roughly 1.1 to 1.5 trillion over 10 years. Do you agree with that? I don't. You think it will be uh, revenue neutral or? So I mean, he, here, here are the numbers, okay? The joint, let's start with joint tax, which scored it at, I think, a billion four fifty, we'll call, uh, call it a, a tr excuse me, a tr one and a half trillion, okay? Um, that was what we had to reconcile to on what we call a static basis with no change. Um, joint tax thought there was about 500 billion of what we call dynamic scoring and revenue that we'd get back. There was also about another 450 or 500 billion in what we call the difference between policy and the baseline. So we, they were measuring it to what they call the baseline. There were tax extenders that were rolled over every year. Again, our view is you should measure it to what the actual policy is. And you know we think there will be uh, over a trillion dollars of growth. So uh, I, I do think this will pay for itself. Now, you're projecting growth out of the government uh, of roughly 3% a year for the next 10 years or so? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, actually about 2.9. But 2 .9. we do believe we can, we predict, for modeling purposes, we use 2.9, um, but we do think we can get to 3% or higher. But if you actually fail, then you got just 2.2 or 2.3, the deficit would, or the debt would be much higher. Presumably. Well, yeah, I mean, by, by definition, right. but it's never going to be higher. Again, the worst case scenario, it's the trillion and a half less the half a billion and okay. what were policy extenders. Well, uh, there are no Democratic votes for the tax bill. So did you try to get Democratic votes? Or was there just no willingness on the Democrats' part to participate? No, we did. And, you know, we had a series of meetings. Um, the president hosted several bipartisan meetings. We had several Democrats fly with us on Air Force One with the president to their home states when he gave speeches. But, you know, from the beginning, um, you know, kind of the Democrats sent a letter to the president and copied me and made very clear kind of what their conditions were. And I think there was a big philosophical difference. We were focused on creating growth and creating things that were good for the American economy. And, they kind of drew a line in the sand. Okay, so if the Democrats were to regain control of the government at some point, let's say the Congress and even the White House at some point, do you worry that the tax bill would be undone because there are no Democratic votes for it? Not, not, not at all. I mean, first of all, uh, I think it's a unlikely hypothetical, but even if it were, um, I think at that period, I mean, you're going to I think it will be clear that you will have the economic growth. And if there is the economic growth, it's not going to be unwound. Okay, so money is going to be, uh, there's a tax on money that's offshore, so you're going to bring money back or you're going to put an excise tax on it, so presumably companies will bring it back. Yes. There's no requirement that they invest it in job creating kinds of things. Why was there no requirement that they use it in a certain way? You know, that, that's, that's a good question, and that was something we talked about a lot, and various people came up with ideas. Should we put conditions? Should we attach it to this? I, th I think our view was if we create the right incentives, that companies, one, will bring it back because we charged them the tax either way, so obviously there's a big incentive to bring it back. But I think, as you know, David, certain industries, people should make capital investments. Certain industries, people should return money to workers, as we've seen with Walmart. So I think philosophically, our view was let the companies allocate that capital, and we believe 70% of it will ultimately flow back to the workers. Now, the president was involved. Did you call him every other day, or how did that process work of for, telling for, him what's going on? The president was unbelievably involved. So, I mean, again, if I go back to the campaign, you know, kind of on his two major economic speeches, one was Detroit and one was New York, I mean, literally, up until he went on stage, he was fine-tuning, you know, the tax rates, what we were doing, we debated them, and, you know, I would say there's no question that for the last year, he, he called either Gary or I or both of us every single day with either he had views or we were reporting back to him 
what we were doing. So when you get a call from the president, somebody says the president's aligned, does that make you nervous or you don't know what he's going to say or that you're, you're happy to get those calls? No, I mean, it, do it doesn't make me nervous at all. I mean, again, I think one of the good things for me in this job is I've known him for a long time. Um, and I, I traveled with him for a year in the campaign. So, you know, kind of I, I wouldn't be here if I didn't feel like right. we could have good two-way conversations. But at the end of the day, I understand he's the president and it's his decision. So on the, the tax bill uh, today, um, as you, you see it, um, you're very happy with it and you don't see any need to make any modifications. You're going to live with this bill. There's no effort to modify it in any way. No, I mean, there, there may be a need for certain technical corrections. Okay. But uh, I think, again, there's, there's nothing we've identified right now that's a problem, but we'll, we'll see if we need to fine-tune so anything. So the debt of the United States is roughly $20 trillion, yes. more or less. Um, and you are uh, in response for making certain that we pay the debt. And as a owner of Treasury bills, I want to make sure that you do pay that debt. Um, are you worried about the debt limit? You're going to run out of capacity. You're actually over the, 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 uh, the period of time now. But you, we are. So you have a couple more months before you can't pay my treasury bills, is that right? So, you know, again, th this was one of the things that, uh, you know, multiple treasury secretaries advised me on before I got into the job. Um, I've been through now one extension, um, you know, kind of a, certain people were critical of, of me in the extension. At the end of the day, this is all about, you know, kind of, we absolutely have to raise the debt ceiling every time we get close to the debt ceiling. I think one of the things the president and I are thinking about is how, how should this process be changed? I mean, we have a debt ceiling, we have a budget, and we have appropriations. And I think, right. you know, David, in any business, you kind of plan what you're going to spend, and then you plan how you finance it. Uh, it's somewhat of a ridiculous process the way we do this. You think and we should have a debt limit at all? I don't know. I, I won't go so far as saying we shouldn't have a debt limit, but I, I do believe that when money is authorized to be spent, there should be some mechanism that the debt limit is also raised to pay for it. So, however, okay. we refine that process. And the other thing, uh, you know, I, we're, we're now in a, uh, I'm, I'm using these Treasury superpowers uh, because we have hit the debt limit. And again, the problem with that is all that does is the more time you extend it, you know, this town doesn't really work right. till you hit a deadline that you need to right. do it. Well, speaking of another deadline, the government will run out of money relatively soon. Um, I think January 19th. Is that uh, well, right? Well, that, that that, that's, again, that's authorization to spend. We won't run out of money. The debt limit is running out. I, I will have the cash. We just won't have the authorization I mean, to spend it. I mean, the, oper the operation of the, 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 uh, the government, the funding of yes, the government. Yes, the appropriation. You think that that will get resolved in time? Um, I, 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 I don't think there will be a shutdown. I think it'll either be resolved or okay. there'll be another CR okay. to extend this okay. for people to work on it. All right, so let's um, go through a couple other things before we uh, get back to the tax bill for a moment. Um, you grew up in New York. You went to Yale, as I mentioned. You went to Goldman Sachs. Why did you want to be an investment banker? And did, was that what you studied uh, in, at, uh, to be in, when you were in college? Or? Um, well, I, I did study economics. Um, I was, when, when I was at Yale, I was actually publisher of the Yale Daily News, and I was very interested in publishing. And uh, I, I remember I actually thought I may want to go into publishing. And I actually applied for a job at Condé Nast for the summer. And I think probably the, one of the best things they ever did was reject me. Right. That uh, they said, thank you very much, but we're not hiring summer interns. So I actually ended up working at Solomon Brothers for three summers and uh, you know, had grown up around Wall Street and really liked the mortgage okay. trading business. That's kind of where I started. OK, so you left Goldman Sachs, and you then started your own financial services company. And one of the companies you bought was IndyMac, and yes. that was controversial at times. Why was it controversial? When you were confirmed, uh, people asked you a lot about it. Why was it so controversial? Sure. So um, you know, uh, I, I was sitting in my office in New York uh, during the summer of 2008 watching TV, all the, the news, and uh, Indi this was kind of in the middle of the crisis, and IndyMac, literally there were people lined up around the block 
uh, trying to get their money out. So th this, was, this was a real bank run. We hadn't had a bank run in this country in a very, very long period of time. And IndyMac was actually one of the, I think one of the only deals, the FDIC actually had to take it over and operate the bank. M most of the way the FDIC took over banks is they'd take it over Friday night, they'd sell it on Friday night, you'd open up for business on, on, on Monday. Um, IndyMac was a highly problematic bank. It had, uh, it had specialized in no-doc loans. Their mortgage portfolio had 30% delinquencies. As I like to say, even in the financial crisis, it was hard to originate loans that were that bad that had those delinquency rates. Um, the only reason I was able to buy it and put together an investment group was no real bank wanted to buy it. I mean, it had, it had every problematic loan. It had construction loans. It had home builder loans. It had a big portfolio of reversed mortgages. Um, so we came and cleaned up. Uh, but the reason why it was controversial is because it had so many delinquent loans that we had to work through all those loans under government loss sharing agreements. Okay, so you ultimately sold it to CIT, did well. Yes. Um, you, um, did you know Donald, well let me ask you about your movie career first before I get to Donald Trump. Yes. Um, what, what does a producer actually do? Um, you know, when you're a producer, I mean you're picking the, the uh, actors or actresses, what does a producer actually do when you're producing all these movies? Uh, so first of all I'd say I, I was probably the least likely person to get in the film business. Um, when I first looked at these investments, uh, in, when I had my own investment business and someone came to us and said, well, you know, we should look at this film investment, I'm like, that's the craziest idea. If we invest in films, everybody will take their money back from us. But we developed a theory, which turned out very well, that if you invest in any one film, it's very risky. If you can put together a portfolio of 50 or 100 films uh, that are high quality films, it, it's a long-term bet on content. And when I made these investments, and partially because I had a technology background, I had a view as that content was going to be worth a lot more money. Uh, at the time, there was no Netflix. At the time, there weren't iPads. Um, but I did understand technology and understood bandwidth, and, and understood that as bandwidth became faster and faster and faster to the consumer, there would be more and more demand. So I, I didn't actually pick any of those films. Uh, I did two deals, one uh, I did with, with Fox, where we did 200, 160 films with Fox, and then 75 but, films with Warner Brothers. But you don't go on the set and say, well, you should act it this way no. or do it that way. Uh, uh, absolutely that. not. I was, I was, the, 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 I was a, the money. All right, so um, I saw you at a conference out in Los Angeles. I think it was the Milken Conference. It once. was. Where you were kind enough to host me for a dinner, and you told I me. I think several years, actually. You did, several years you did. And, um, I would say um, one time you said you were going to become the finance chair for Donald Trump's presidential campaign. I said, look, I've lived in Washington a long time. He is not going to be president of the United States. So are you sure you know what you're doing? And your response was you did know what you were doing. Yes. And how did you happen to know Donald Trump? So um, I, I knew him. Uh, I've known him for about 15 years. Um, you know, I would describe it was more socially than business. We did a little bit of business together. Um, we looked at a lot of investments together, and we got to we got to know each other quite well. And I actually had been speaking to him, e even going back to while he was thinking of of running. Matter of fact, he came out to Los Angeles. I remember having dinner with him right before he announced. And after he decided to run, you know, I'd come visit him every couple of months and be like, how can I help? And he's like, well, I'm financing the whole thing myself now. Thank you very much. And then right after he won New York, I was actually in New York, he called me up the next day and said, uh, do you want to come on board? I'd like you to be my finance chairman. And we agreed to meet in Indianapolis the next day and talk about it, because I was in California, actually back in California. And I will tell you, I went to this event. Uh, I don't know if anybody in this room ever went to a Trump rally, okay? But uh, I showed up. There, this doesn't there, look like a big Trump rally group, <laughs> I would say. There, there, there were, there were 30,000 people who had been waiting probably three or four hours. And uh, the only way I can describe this is it was like showing up with Mick Jagger to a Rolling Stones concert. And it was, 
the minute I saw that, I knew he was going to absolutely win and be president. And the more the more I traveled with him, the more convinced I was okay. that he, he right. hit on something. Now, had you been a Democrat or a Republican? I had or? been absolutely a Republican. I, you know, for whatever reason, I, I gave well, I gave money to a bunch of Democrats, as you can appreciate. People like you would call me up and ask for favors. Not you, I right. might add, but people right. like you, and uh, <laughs> you know. I, I did write some checks, but uh, I, I've always been a Republican. And um, you, most of your friends, though, in Hollywood area probably were liberal Democrats. So when they uh, heard you were doing this, did they call you and say, what are you doing? Yes. And <laughs> have they come to try to get favors from you since then, or they leave you alone now? Uh, they haven't tried to get favors, but I, I, I would say, you know, e even a lot of people who were skeptical have come around seeing the economic plan and seeing what this okay. has done to the economy and the markets. Okay, so he was elected president. Um, did you think he was going to win um, at I, the end? I, I told you, I was 100% convinced. And even at the end, when we were seeing the Florida polling numbers, I was hearing from people on the ground. I said, these polls are not right. He's going to win Florida, and he will win. Okay, so he called you and said, uh, how would you like to be Secretary of Treasury? And did you have any doubt you wanted to do that job? Actually, he didn't call me uh, right after he won. Oh. I was part of the transition. And actually, he put me, even though I knew him well and everything else, he put me through an interview process uh, like, like other people. And being the good uh, former investment banker, I showed up with my yellow pad and had a whole presentation and kind of walked him through what I would do if I had the job. And that's literally the, still the game plan that I'm operating on today. Okay, so when you, he offered you a job, did you realize that the IRS audits every year the tax returns of the Secretary of the Treasury, and you would have to be audited every year. And was that okay with you? You had no problems. So I, I didn't. Matter of fact, I, I, I will tell you. One of the things I, I mean, I knew I'd have to sell lots of, I'd have to sell everything. You know, that didn't bother me. I, I, I did not realize how difficult the process was of going through a confirmation. I think I delivered, like, literally 8,000 pages. I mean. And the most ridiculous part is, you know, I'd say I'm selling, you know, this, 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 this. I literally sold everything, and they're still, well, we want to look at every investment. So how much did it cost in legal and accounting fees? It cost fees? a lot. I, I won't say it here, and we're on live TV, but uh, it, was, it was very expensive. Okay, so what's the best part about being Secretary of Treasury, other than interviews like this? Um, it's definitely not interviews like right, this, right. although I'm, 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 uh, I'm always happy to be here, right, okay. and uh, this, this is a great right. part. So the best part is second to this. Um, so. what, I mean, it is, it is by far the most interesting thing I've ever done, and I think the thing that's, that's great about this job is it touches on so many different aspects of the government. So obviously a big focus of what I do is domestic and international finance. But uh, a big component of what we do is manage all the sanction programs. So whether it's Iran, whether it's North Korea, whether it's Venezuela, whether it's Russia, kind of I'm, I'm a member of the National Security Council, and this is a big part of the strategy that we employ for foreign policy. So the job touches on a big part of this. And I'd say the other thing that's great is we have the best location. We got the best building in the best location. Right. Matter of fact, the president, every time he flies in at Marine One, he's like, your building's a lot bigger than my building. No. But uh, <laughs> the best thing is it's six minutes from my office to his office and six minutes back. But his button is bigger than anybody else's, right? <laughs> that, that, that is true. And um, is there a secret tunnel under the Treasury building that goes to the White House? Actually, there, there, there was a there was a tunnel at one point. Um, I won't tell you whether the tunnel exists or not, but uh, I will tell you I don't use the tunnel. Uh, I literally walk out of the steps. They open a little gate for me. I walk into the east wing. I walk through the east wing, through the Rose Garden, into the, the okay. west wing. So uh, you made a trip that got a lot of attention to Fort Knox. Um, is our gold really there? It is. And um, why do we need all that gold? Because who cares about the gold anymore? Well, why do we need it? Well, that, that's, that's a good question, I think, is, as you know. Um, at one point, we were on the gold standard. That's how we got all the gold. Um, most of the gold was bought during that period of time. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been a good asset. So uh, 
you know, we've got gold there, and we also have gold at the New York Fed. So and it's I've, well protected. I've actually had the opportunity to see both of them. But they're well protected. They have guards they, around they, the clock and everything? Uh, it's classified, so I won't tell you what's around the clock, but it's very well protected. Okay. What about Bitcoin? Um, are you comfortable with that currency? And what do you think the U.S. government should do about it? Should we encourage it, discourage do, it? Do you own any? Is that I, I actually asking? don't. I, okay. I don't own any of it. I, 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 don't I just wanted it. to check. No, I own no Bitcoin. I don't even know what it is, really. But um, <laughs> um, though I, I know I missed the boat on that. But, uh, but is that something that you're worried about that could replace the dollar as a currency? And So, uh, I mean, first let me say, uh, I'm, we are very focused on cyber currencies, crypto, what do you call them, cryptocurrencies, cyber currencies, we're very focused on this. And actually at the last FSOC meeting that I chaired, we set up a working group. We're working with all the regulators. So really the, the biggest issue, um, I have two issues with them that we're focused on. One is we want to make sure that bad people cannot use these currencies to do bad things. So in the United States, and people may not realize this, under our laws, if you have a wallet to own Bitcoins, that company has the same obligation as a bank to know your customer. So in the United States, we have rules that for money laundering, for uh, all different types of things, we can track those activities. The rest of the world doesn't have that. So one of the things we will be working very closely with the G20 on is making sure that this doesn't become the Swiss numbered bank accounts and right. we do that. The other concern I have is there's a lot of speculation in this. And you know, I want to make sure that consumers who are trading this understand the risks um, because you know I am concerned that consumers could get hurt. Or do you worry that, like Russia, it was announced, I don't know if it was, it was a legitimate government report, maybe fake news, I don't know, but um, that Russia is thinking of it and, uh, coming up with its own cryptocurrency as a way to get around sanctions. Is that something you're worried about? Not, not, not at all. No, I mean, I, I, don't think it's a, I don't think that's a concern. Okay. I mean, there, there are countries, and again, this is something actually I've, I've spoken to the Fed about. So there's cryptocurrencies like a Bitcoin, which, uh, you know, effectively it's instead of euros or dollars, you, you have a different currency. There are central banks that are thinking of, instead of issuing cash, phys physical cash, issuing a digital currency. So, I mean, the Fed has contemplated and looked at, and I don't think they have any intention of doing this in the near term, you could issue digital dollars. Uh, the Fed and we don't think there's any right. need for that at this point. Right. Talk about physical currency. Um, there's a picture of you uh, getting, uh, I guess, $1 bills, I guess it was, from the Treasury, and every secretary signs it. Do you have to improve your handwriting before you actually put it on? Did you practice this? Uh, or? I, I, I did, because I'll tell you, my signature, I'm sure like yours, was perfected from signing lots of documents in like a right. nanosecond, but was completely illegible. So now my signature is really neat, and uh, of course I've now been criticized that it's too neat on the bill. But if you actually sign a check with your real signature and then you sign the dollar bill this way, people can ever compare that maybe? Oh, I, 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 actually, David, uh, I thought of that problem. And now I have institutionalized my neat signature. Okay. So I sent new documents to the banks and signed checks that way as well. So um, your predecessor said that, I guess, on the $20 bill, we would change some parts of it. But actually, he left office before that could happen. It takes a couple years to get to change the currency. Have you had any plans to change what he proposed, or what are you thinking about the $20 bill? So, um, you know, as you mentioned, uh, the previous administration looked at changing the currency. Um, let me first start with, you know, kind of why we, why we changed the currency. And the reason why we changed the currency is all about counterfeiting. So there have been changes to the currency over time. If you look at the $100 bill, there's certain features that obviously you can now see. Um, there's actually certain features that are in the bills that you can't see, that only machines can see and detect whether they're counterfeit or not. So I have met with the Secret Service. Uh, I have met with the Fed. We are working, our focus is working on the next kind of uh, security features in the bill and you know kind of this, this is this is years away okay 
But on the question of whether you will still have uh, Harriet Tubman, we, we, we haven't made any decisions as to whether we'll change the bill or we won't change the bill okay. in terms of that. But again, our, 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 the money has been a the money has been a certain way for a long period of time, and we'll look at whether we change it or okay. not. Um, when you mentioned the Fed, uh, it was reported in the press that you had recommended that Jay Powell become the chairman of the Fed. Was that your recommendation? So I'm, I'm not going to comment specifically. Uh, uh, you know, I, I was very involved in a recommendation to the president. I'm not going to comment on who I recommended or who I didn't. But I would say I'm, I'm very supportive of Jay in this job. We look forward to Thank him. You. I think Janet Yellen has done a great job. And uh, I look forward to now working with Jay. How many, uh, how frequently do you meet with the chairman of the Fed? Every week. So we, we alternate. We, we meet every week, alternating between their office and my office. And you ever say, well, maybe interest rates should stay low. It would be helpful with the economy. You can't quite give them a prod about what to do on interest rates? Or no. You... I mean, I, I respect the independence of the interest rate decisions. Right. We talk about what the impact of the economy is. We talk about regulatory issues. We talk about international issues. I mean, it, it's interesting because when I started these meetings, I was like, what are we going to have to talk about every week? And, and, and I will tell you, there's not been a week where Janet Yellen and I have not literally spent an hour talking about important things. And, and a lot of times, it's, they're very different, very different issues. So well, is it awkward? It was reported in the press that you were recommending somebody other than her, and you still were meeting with her. Did that get to be awkward in those meetings? No. So um, the economy, um, what are you projecting for the economy this year in terms of growth, inflation rate, uh, unemployment rate? Higher growth, moderate inflation, lower unemployment. All right. right. What is your biggest worry about the economy today? We've had eight years of uninterrupted growth, more or less, the third longest period since World War II. At some point, something will probably slow down. Are you worried about it happening this year or next year? You know, David, it's a good question. I mean, you know, what I would say is in people in my job, people in your job, are not very good at predicting necessarily what the next problem is. And, and a lot of reasons why the next problem turns out to be such a big problem is because it's something that people haven't anticipated. So, I mean, I, I, I would say, you know, if there's something I, I am concerned about from the financial system, um, I would say cyber is something I'm very focused on. Um, I do think it's a, you know, kind of, it's one of these areas that we've got to continue to invest a lot of money privately, the government, make sure that the government is working with the private industry. But that, that would be the one area okay. that, you know, kind of, if there were an issue, would be concerning. Now, um a number of Treasury uh, Cabinet Secretaries, including you, and the President are going to Davos next week. Um, Davos is a place for the global elite gather, but the President's constituency is not the global elite. So why is he going there? Well, David, you know, I, I got asked this question yesterday uh, when I gave a uh, brief news conference at, at the White House. And uh, first of all, um, I didn't realize that it was the global elite, okay? Uh, you right. tell me a little bit more about. I realize that globalists like you do attend. But uh, actually, uh, I've looked at the list. There's an awful lot of world leaders. There's an awful lot of finance chairs. There's an awful lot of business people. So to me, this is, okay. this is no more the global elite than the, the G20 or the okay. event that I attended with you in Saudi Arabia or the Milken Conference. Um, this is an important economic uh, agenda. So when you meet finance ministers around the world, do you under wonder how they became a finance minister? Or you often say these people are really impressive? Or how do you get along with these finance ministers? Um, you know, generally very well. I mean, I'd say the, the person who I've been the most impressed with is Wolfgang Schäuble, who's uh, now retiring from the finance chair. I think he's the longest serving. Um, but, you know, I, I, I've had several private dinners with him. And to me, you know, spending time with people like him, it's really an education. I mean, he, his perspectives going back to the fall of the Berlin Wall and the changes to the economy there, um, some, some people are very interesting, some people uh, are not. And you've met with, mem uh, which ones are not? Um, uh, uh, <laughs> you, 
You've met, I, I gave you one of the really interesting okay. ones. So you've met, uh, you've met with a number of your predecessors. What yes. is the most important advice your predecessors give you about the job of being Secretary of Treasury? Um, I think there's been, a lot, there's been a lot of good advice. Um, I, th I think probably uh, the most important part and the most important advice has been around kind of the various different aspects of the job. And, you know, kind of different people have had different advice on policies, but I think kind of one of the things the Treasury is known for um, is the career staff. You know, we, we have a very long, very professional career staff. I think in other agencies, the politics gets much more impacted through the career staff. I think Treasury is really known for kind of, and again, because so many of the functions are operational, uh, just, you know, great career staff. Okay. Now, the legislative uh, goals of the president this year, uh, infrastructure, is that one of his highest goals? And it is. And uh, do you see that being bipartisan or will it be solely Republican? No, that, that, that definitely has to be bipartisan. And, uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot of work done on it already. Now, the health care legislation, the president made an effort earlier to change Obamacare. That didn't quite work, but some of the mandate has been taken out through the Treasury bill, or through the tax bill. Yes. Is, um, is, are you done now on trying to make any legislative changes on the health care bill? I, I think that's something that the president is considering and, and talking to Congress about. I mean, I would say, you know, what we were able to accomplish in the tax bill was getting rid of the individual mandate. I think fundamentally the idea that you should charge people penalties because they're forced to buy insurance. That's something uh, we didn't agree with and we think makes sense to come out. The other thing we're now looking at is, and, and again, we're working with the Department of Labor and, and, and others on uh, regulations that will allow different businesses to get together and different associations to get together and pool across state lines um, their insurance buying. And I think that's going to create a great opportunity for companies to, to lower their costs. Lots, lots of companies that independently would be very expensive as opposed to having to go into the exchanges will be able to buy down their risk. Now, do you have your full complement of assistant secretaries or most of the people you need now, or are you still working to get them confirmed? Um, no, we, we still have several people that we're waiting to get confirmed, and we have a few more people that are going to the process to be announced. Is it harder to get them through the White House process or the Senate no, process? Not, not, not even close. Get, getting them through the White House process has been very easy for us. I mean, again, I think we have very good communications the White House. Getting it through the Senate is, is very challenging. I mean, I think, I think the statistic is that uh, at this rate, you know, kind of we won't fill the government. Okay, so now you see the president regularly. Is he happy with uh, the job? Does he wish he hadn't run for president? Is he happy being president? I think he loves being president. Okay, now before he was elected president, he actually came to the Economic Club of Washington. We had an interview. Do you think he should come back and... Um... I, I, I do. All right, well, you recommend that I to will. him. I okay? absolutely. All right, so um, let me ask you now, you have been Treasury Secretary now for about almost a year. Yes. Um, you enjoy the job. Uh, do you have any plans to, to stay for one year, two year, three years? You stay the whole first uh, term, uh, second I, term? I, I'll be here as long as the president uh, is, is president. And when, uh, Meaning either four years or seven, seven years, eight years. Okay, so you, you're happy with the job now. Some, Absolutely. Some of your to him. predecessors have gone on to be Secretary of State. Do you aspire to do that? I do not. Okay. Thrilled, thrilled with my job, don't want another job, uh, happy to do this. Now, where are the egos biggest? Hollywood, Washington, or Wall Street? That is really a tough competition. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, where are the people the nicest? <laughs> tough, uh, <laughs> Washington. 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 People are definitely the nicest here. Okay. So, um, That's well, my story, and I'm sticking with it. All right. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you very much for coming. I appreciate your taking thank the time. You, thank you, Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.